Hey guys, thanks so much for joining us on another episode of Calvary Conversations. My name is Mariah and I'm here with Pastor Craig Roders. What's up? We're also here with my mom and Pastor Craig's wife, Teresa Roders. Hey. And she is on because we are going to be praying for her to be healed and just to have faith. And that's what we'll be talking about today with Pastor Mike Shreve. We had him on episodes two and three, so you can go back and watch that. It was talking about why not to practice yoga and how the New Age has infiltrated the church. So without further ado, it's my honor and privilege to welcome Pastor Mike Shreve. Pastor Mike, thanks so much for joining us again on Calvary Conversations. Well, it's a joy to be with you. I've been looking forward to this with great anticipation. Yes, so Mike has been on episode two and three, so you guys can go back and watch that. In the description, we'll have that. And we just would like you, Mike, to share just a little bit of who you are, what you do. And today we're going to be talking about healing. So how did you get involved in healing ministry? Well, this year is my 50th year of ministry. Praise God. I started, (laughs) yeah, and I turned 70 years old too. So 70 and 50 or 120. (laughs) And 50 years ago, I started out in the ministry by giving away everything I owned With another brother, we gave away all our money, all our possessions, and started hitchhiking across the country, preaching on college campuses during the Jesus Movement era. And that developed into ministry in churches, and then someone gave me a tent and a big truck, and we started uh, carrying a tent around the country and ministering that way and had some amazing, amazing awakenings in different cities we went to. But uh, fast forward 15 years. During that period of time, I was always praying for the sick and those that had physical problems and expecting the miraculous, and we saw a lot of great results. But then there was a significant turning point in my life where I had this powerful, powerful dream that just changed my whole concept of healing altogether. Uh, In the dream, I saw an angel of the Lord come up and write on a scroll that a man of God was holding. And it was quite a large scroll, uh, probably about eight feet across. And this angel came up and wrote in script healing is the expression of God's love. Amen. And up to that point, I had fallen into the erroneous idea. I think it was somewhat of a slightly erroneous idea that you almost had to force God's hand to make him mm-hmm. heal. You had to somehow quote his word so firmly that he would feel obligated to fulfill it out of a sense of responsibility. And the angel just wrote, healing is the expression of God's love, Mm -hmm. that he heals because he loves, and he wants to eliminate the pain in our lives, both spiritually, emotionally, mentally, and physically. And that was powerful by itself. But then all of a sudden, from way off in the distance, I heard a man of God, a man I recognized as having a prophetic mantle, cry aloud with a a very powerful voice. And he said, there are even some who will receive creative power. Hmm. And I woke up out of the dream. And that was ringing in my mind. There are even some who will receive creative power. And all of a sudden, the Holy Spirit swept over me and said, if you'll do a certain thing, I may or may not mention it, it was quite a sacrifice, but God was telling me, if you will do this particular thing, then I'll allow that anointing to be released in your life. And it was the very thing I told God I did not want to do, Uh, (laughs) which sounds about norm, right? In fact, I'll go ahead and mention it. Uh, I had already been on one 40-day fast, and I was a very small person to begin with, about, I guess, 130 pounds back then. 
And when I went on a 40 day fast, there wasn't hardly anything left of me. I was a bag of bones and it was very difficult. And I told God, I'll do anything else. Just please don't call me on another 40 day fast. <laughs> but the Holy Spirit swept over me and God said, if you'll do it again, I'll release that anointing in your life. And strangely, ironically, the second time around, it was very easy. It was very simple uh, because uh, I felt like I was eating the whole time. And at the end of the 40 day fast, I announced one night that we were going to have a miracle service. Mm -hmm. And a lady came in who had been in a car wreck and one of her legs was twisted around as a result. And the other leg was twisted around from a birth deformity. Mm -hmm. And she dragged her way from the door to the back pew. Mm -hmm. And it took her a long time to work her way, to inch her way mm -hmm. over. And I preached on healing and miracles and creative power and gave an invitation. And she began walking toward the front. Wow. And it took her a long time. And I felt I felt like I was not being compassionate. I should just go to her, but I mm -hmm. felt God speak to my heart. Every step she took, her faith was growing mm -hmm. because she was fighting the good fight of faith Amen. to get that place where she could receive. And when she got up to the front, I reached out to pray for her and the power of God hit her and knocked her to the floor. Hmm. And moments later, she jumped up and ran around the church. <laughs> wow. And she contacted me. It was, it was phenomenal. Really? I mean, that place exploded. Amen. And she contacted me on Facebook about two years ago and said, I'm still walking. I'm still healed. And uh, God's good. Amen. And so hey, it worked. Amen. Hey, Mike, really, can I, can I really... ask you a question on that? Because you know how it's like sometimes um, people, you know, we're saved by grace and not by works. But can you explain or sort of unpack for our listeners like why you did a 40 day fast and pretty much back to back, right? 80 day fast, right? You didn't really have much time between, right? Sounds like well, no, it wasn't back to back. Was it? It oh, wasn't just, back it was to just... back. I'd, okay. I'd done one a couple of years prior. Oh, okay, okay. So it was so hard, but this one wasn't. Okay, why? Can you explain? Because a lot of people with prayer and fasting, they don't kind of understand it. What? How would you explain why God asked you to do that? What was the purpose mm -hmm. to prepare you for that anointing? What, what, how would you explain why God asked you to do that? I, I certainly can. I believe that you can go too far with the idea that you're earning a manifestation mm -hmm. of the yeah. gifts. And so I don't think it works that way as much as it does subduing the flesh. Mm -hmm. That's good. Because when you fast, the enemy has nothing to work through. Yeah. And spirits and negative attitudes from the lower nature work through us more readily when our flesh is in control. Mm -hmm. But when we're subduing the control of the flesh and denying ourselves through fasting, it just bumps you up to the next level of spiritual power. And I'm not sure why it's that way. It's just the way the kingdom functions. Uh, that uh, I think Jesus made it clear it wasn't optional. He didn't say if you pray. He said when you Amen. pray. Don't do like the Pharisees. And he didn't say if you fast. He said when you fast. Amen. This comes out with only prayer and fasting. Right? Yeah, that's true. Right? Yeah. And the, the demonic, yeah. Amen. And then do you have yeah. your other points that you would you wanted to share with that? Oh, uh, well, uh, that was the main thing I wanted to share about the beginning, the mm -hmm. launch of a healing Amen. ministry yes. in my life. And uh, it wasn't long after that that I went to India mm. and had an incredible thing happen in India mm. where I was in a city called Kumbakonam. <laughs> where there had not been any Western missionaries do an open-air crusade in the middle of the city. It was a Hindu center. There were seven huge Hindu temples all around the field wow. where I was located. And that night, we may have had 1,000 people, 1,500 show up. They were sitting on the walls, sitting on the ground, uh, surrounding the place. And it was the opening night of the crusade. 
I did not know that there were six radical Hindus who had planned my death wow. that night. Uh, and most Hindu people are extremely tolerant and gentle and kind, mm -hmm. uh, but there's radical elements in every group, right. even Christians that I would not uh, agree with. I wouldn't even agree with their Christianity yeah. <laughs> uh, because they uh, go so far that direction. But anyway, uh, they had decided that they were going to let me speak the whole time because then the maximum amount of people would be there because they kept filtering in. And so they waited until my sermon was over and there was a stairwell behind the platform and a big 20 foot high gate with a big padlock on it. And right at the end of my message, I felt this tremendous demonic oppression. It was choking me. I, it, it was very difficult to talk. I had to force every word out. Mm -hmm. And all of a sudden, unexpectedly, God dropped a word of knowledge in my spirit. Mm -hmm. And God said, call for the deaf and tell them if what you preached is true, every deaf person will hear mm -hmm. again. Okay. And if what you preached is not true, they, can, uh, they won't hear and they can throw you out of their city. Mm -hmm. Well, I like to say I was extremely confident and bold and not uh, quaking in my boots, so to speak. Yeah. But uh, that wasn't the case. Yeah. To uh, put the ministry in the name of Jesus on the line that way took uh, a really s strong moment of decisiveness. Yeah. But I went ahead and did what I felt impressed yeah. to do. And thank God I probably wouldn't be alive if I hadn't done yeah. it. They brought seven deaf people. Wow. Four of them were totally deaf. Three were deaf in one ear. And the first words that trotted through my mind was, you better pray for one of the ones with one deaf ear first. And, get them <laughs> the and I got angry at that. I thought, no, no, no. If God told me to do that, he doesn't need to work up to it. Yeah. Right. So I said, bring me somebody totally deaf first. Amen. And they brought me a young man, 23 years old, that had been deaf for about five years. And I started to pray for him. I laid my hands on his ears and began to declare his healing. Amen. Knowing that he knew nothing about Jesus, there was no way he could believe because he had no biblical worldview to base his faith on. And so I have a problem with people that say, you have to believe Amen. to be healed because many times I've seen people that had very little faith Amen. and even times, and people had no faith wow. who got healed. Exactly. So sometimes God defies being boxed in by rules. Uh, but anyway, right when I laid my hands on him, all of a sudden I heard this crunching, crashing sound behind me. I didn't know these guys had brought a big sledgehammer wow. and they were hitting padlock. And they hit it about four or five times. And the whole time I'm thinking, I can't afford to get distracted. I just laid everything on the line. And all of a sudden, the gate swung open. Six men came running at me with this angry look on their faces. And I turned around to see what was happening. And right at that precise moment, that man jumped out of my hands and 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 started jumping up and down excitedly saying, I can hear, I can hear, what? I can hear. And the crowd went wild. Amen. And the six guys that came to beat me up, their plan was to beat me up, mm -hmm. tie me to the bumper of their car and drag me through the city. Wow. And I talked with them the next day and I said, why did you want to do that? And in broken English, the leader said, we wanted to discourage missionary activity in our town. Oh, wow. I said, well, if you had done it, yeah. you probably would have discouraged yeah. me. I guarantee you. <laughs> yeah. If I could have felt anything, I would have felt discouraged. But uh, anyway, God is such an amazing Amen. God. He had it worked out in such intricate detail because the head of the Hindu radical group saw this guy jumping up and down screaming, I can hear. And he walked over and whispered and had him repeat it back. And he shook his head amazed. And he whispered in his other ear and he repeated it. And he shook his head amazed. 
and he called his men over and they all started checking him. Hmm. I thought it was a pastorally appointed checking committee to verify <laughs> the miracle. That's good. Because they were talking among themselves saying, it is a miracle. Hmm. It is truly a miracle. I found out the next day, and this is the genius of God, that the head of the radical Hindu group was the next door neighbor of the man who got healed. Wow. wow. That's, That's cool. amazing. Now, That's you cool. can't set up yeah. anything any better than that. Uh, that was only God. Oh, that's so amazing. And I, I just love that story because... It just shows that so many times we can like even be afraid and be, you know, not sure. But when we just put our faith in God, like, okay, God, you have to do this because there's nothing in me that can do this, like in my own strength. And that's what I definitely see even when you were talking about prayer and fasting and you were saying that it really is breaking down our flesh and our pride thinking, oh, I am a healer and I'm this because it's only through the blood of Jesus and what he can do that these people are healed. And so why is so, why is faith so important? And like you were saying, it doesn't have to just even be for that person, but why is faith so important to have in Jesus? And um, especially when we're praying for healing. Well, curiously, Mariah, Jesus never took credit for the healings that were performed by the father through him. Mm -hmm. Over and over again, he would say, your faith Mm -hmm. has made you whole. He never said, I made you whole. Mm. He said, your faith has made you whole. And so faith is a, a powerful thing, so much so that I believe part of the reason that sometimes people involved in the new age or people involved in other religious expressions besides true biblical Christianity, sometimes by exercising faith, they see miraculous things or healings take place. Because faith is a powerful force even when it's disconnected from God. Uh, and, And people have got to understand where I'm coming from. I'm not advocating that by any means. But like, say, a secular person that has no concept of spirituality at all, has faith that he can build a business. And if he confidently, tenaciously holds on to that faith, he can go from ground zero all the way up to a multi-million dollar company. And he does it because of confident faith. It's soulish. Mm -hmm. It's not faith in God. It's faith in his own ability or faith in the processes he implements. But if faith can be that powerful when it's disconnected from God, yeah. how much more powerful it is when it's in alignment with God. Yeah. It's, yeah. it's in alignment with his word. Yeah. I like how Henry so, Ford said that he says, Henry Ford, Ford Company said, if you believe you can, that's true. And if you believe you can't, that's true also. So kind of saying what you're saying, like it's amazing, like you said, even though it wasn't through faith in God, but faith they can do it. So like you said, how much more when you have faith in Almighty God, that he can do all things, what can happen? People ask me all the time, well, if it really works, how come everybody doesn't get healed? Mm -hmm. How come 100% of the people you pray for don't get healed? And I don't really have an answer for that. Mm -hmm. Catherine Coleman said that was the first thing she was going to ask God when she gets (laughs) to heaven, why why they didn't all get healed. And that's just a mystery. And I've seen people, as I mentioned, I've seen people that didn't believe yeah. yep. who got yeah. healed. Amen. That happened in her uh, meeting. And I, pardon? That happened in one of her, I don't know if you read the book, uh, Daughter of Destiny, about Catherine yes, Coleman. I but did. she said, remember, I forget who the guy was, who, Cunningham or something, but the, the, the guy who did her biography, but said that there was like 10 uh, tuberculosis people healed and he went to them and said you're all healed right so you've given your heart to christ and 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 like only one or two of them gave their heart to christ but the other eight said no i'm Mm. i'm I'm thankful but no i'm not going to give my and he was just amazed at how these people knew they were healed by god but weren't willing to surrender their lives Uh, which is strange but jesus spent three and a half years healing sick people before he provided forgiveness for sin Mm. and before he provided the means to the crucifixion and resurrection for people to be born again. And so uh, 
God, I believe, has a place in his heart for people to such degree that even when they're not as minded toward him as they should be, he still wants wholeness and health in their lives. Amen. Because that's so much a part of his character, it's become his name. Right. In Exodus 15, 26, uh, of course, this brings in a different aspect of healing. He said uh, to the children of Israel, if they would keep his statutes and, ob uh, and observe his laws, then uh, he said, none of the diseases that I brought upon the Egyptians will come upon thee, for I am the Lord who heals you. And of course, in the Hebrew is right. Yahweh Rapha. Uh, I am the Lord who heals you. But God's concept of healing was different than our concept. Our concept is we get sick and we ask God to heal us. But God's concept was not even allowing the sickness to get to you to begin with. He said, I will not bring on you the diseases that came upon the Egyptians. But in that case, and, and this is probably an important aspect to bring in, in that case, uh, it was dependent on them keeping God's rules, which included dietary laws, mm. which meant they were not to eat pork and they were not to eat shellfish and anything out of the ocean except fish with scales. And God had certain things that I believe were more prone toward causing disease in that day than they are now because there's certain uh, advances in technology that have taken place and, of course, refrigeration. Yeah. But uh, those kind of foods gather bacteria very quickly. And I think it was important for them to follow God's rules, not just for the sake of following rules, but God gave those rules right. to prevent them from getting sick. Yeah. And uh, personally, uh, I, uh, I watch my diet very closely. I had a tumor come up in my body about 20 years ago. And it was getting larger and larger very quickly. And I went to a friend of mine who's a doctor, but he also got baptized in the Holy Spirit in one of my meetings. So he was a doctor who spoke tongues. <laughs> that's good. <laughs> and, uh, yeah, yeah that, that's the kind I like to uh, visit <laughs> if I have to. But uh, anyway, I, I asked him to take a look at it, and, he's, and he uh, did some examination. And he said, uh, if God doesn't heal you, you may have some very, very serious problems. Mm -hmm. And so for the next month, I tackled it two ways. First, I juiced twice, two to three times a day, mostly green juices, mm -hmm. and, and tried to eat only organic raw foods uh, to really strengthen my immune system. But then secondly, for that entire month, I commanded. I didn't beg God. I didn't say, oh, God, please heal me. I commanded. I, I said, this tumor has got to die. You have, you have invaded a body that you have no right to invade. You are a trespasser. And I command you to wither and die by the power of Jesus' name. Amen. Now, there's, there's people that really dismiss that as uh, a wrong way to approach God for healing. And yet there's plenty of biblical evidence. When Peter spoke to the man at the gate, beautiful, he didn't say, oh, God, please heal this man. He said, silver and gold have I none, but such as I have give I thee. In the name of Jesus Christ, rise up and walk. I personally believe the prayer of faith is a prayer of command. It's not a prayer of pleading. It's a prayer of command. I believe God hears people when they plead with him. And because I, I've seen tremendous miracles happen when people weren't confessing and claiming their miracle. And they were just pleading with God and God healed them. Uh, so God breaks all of his rules uh, or all the rules we can try and box him in with. But still, uh, I over a period of a month, it, it quit growing and started reducing in size until it was about the size of the end of my thumb. And, and, and it's been that way for 20 years now. It hasn't changed Amen. its size. Amen. Still little evidence there to remind <laughs> me of what I did. <laughs> yeah. 
Yeah. But it's dead. Amen. It's just a dead piece of flesh. It's no threat to me now. Amen. Now, now, Pastor Mike, with that, I want to say, because you know how sometimes the extreme faith movement, or, or I'm sorry, you should say, you know, kind of the, uh, what you would call it, uh, uh, what's it, uh, prosperity doctrine. You just, you just claim everything, claim a Cadillac claim. Now, can you break that down to balance? Because, you know, I always say, too, we with things, right, if you if you have the faith of must seed, speak mm. to that mountain, say, be uprooted and cast the sea. But yet, the reason you would say, so you're really not commanding God, right? You're just agreeing with God because you believe God is Jehovah Rapha. He wants to heal. And so because, you know, sometimes, you know, it's like I always say, we have to balance it with when Jesus said, um, not my will, when he requested this cup to pass the cross, not my will, but your will be done. But you would say, what would you say on that? Because you believe healing is part of the atonement part of the atonement by his stripes were healed so you're just agreeing with god like how can you explain you know what i'm trying to say i'm saying there are people that would say you know don't right. command god but you are sort of you're speaking like what i say i don't know if you agree but like to my wife's cancer i just command cancer to be gone so i'm speaking to the mountain of cancer to be uprooted because like you said she's a child of god cancer is not of god that's part of the fall by his stripes were healed so i'm commanding that cancer and then i'm asking loosing the healing of god can you kind of explain that a little bit because you know like you said there's so many groups that go extreme but just where we're where you're really not commanding god you just would say you're green how, how would you say it i would say i'm speaking as an oracle of god or speaking as one who's in agreement with the word of god and echoing the word of yeah, god that's good. And that's how we're supposed to speak. If any man speak, let him speak as the oracles of God. First Peter 4, what is that? 411, I believe it is. And an oracle of God is someone who is a mouthpiece of God. And we have a fantastic example of doing that in a story that is quite peculiar in the Old Testament, where, where uh, Moses passed from this world and God buried him. And for some reason... Satan wanted that body. We don't really know why. He may have wanted uh, the children of it. He may have wanted to disclose its location to the children of Israel where they'd build a shrine to it like they were used to down in Egypt and deify Moses. Yeah. Like they did with Who the, knows? the serpent. They did with the rod. Remember the serpent? They did that. Right, with, right. So they get rid of it. Oh, that's a good point. And, and so God didn't want them to know where Moses was. So Satan and Michael, the archangel, faced off over the body of Moses. And how did Michael win that battle? He said, the Lord rebuke you, Satan. Now, wait a second. That sounds a little audacious, doesn't it? That he would say, the Lord rebuke you? No, he should have said, I, Michael, the archangel rebuke you. But he knew he was God's representative in that battle. And he knew that he had to speak just as God would if he were there doing it himself. Right. And that's where boldness comes in. And some people think that is audacity and that is over the line. And I understand where they're coming from, but I disagree. Yeah. Yeah. Because I've seen too many instances where it worked. Yeah. And I like to see to base my faith on things that yeah. work. <laughs> yeah, exactly. It does it doesn't always work yeah, though. Yeah. And that's what's so curious. Yeah. And I was asked about that recently. Somebody said, well how do you deal with that? Doesn't it devastate your faith? Doesn't it discourage you? And I said, yes it does, but I look at it this way. And a good illustration is Babe Ruth. Mm. Babe Ruth oh, yeah. was the home run yeah. king, yeah. right? But a lot of people don't know he was also the strikeout <laughs> kid. Mm -hmm. He struck out more than yeah. anybody else. I think two thirds he struck and out he, more than he hit home runs. Yeah, and he hit home runs more than anybody else. So, if he had allowed the times when he missed to discourage him, where he wouldn't try as hard when he hit, right. he probably never would have been the record setter that he was. Right. But he had to just keep swinging at the ball as if every single time it would be a home run. And that's what we've got to do. We've got to pray for every person as if 100% of the time they're going to be healed. Yeah. Knowing that we may not always connect and hit a home run, yeah. but we've got to approach every situation as if we will. Yeah. And then if we get a good percentage, 
it will be uh, the result of our bold, bold faith. Yeah, that's good. And it is amazing, Mike, how, I don't know, but, but the people I really had faith for, I felt like I had faith for, sometimes they'll get healed. And the people I really just kind of prayed and really didn't have to see like I was really that into it. I was busy after a sermon, tired, and they're the ones that got healed. It's just amazing how, you know, like you said, there's no box because, you know, I mean, times where I knew, I'm like, this person's going to be healed. I knew it didn't get healed, but people I just prayed kind of, you know, I don't know how to say it, but you know, I just prayed kind of quick. I didn't feel, I didn't really sense anything because sometimes I'll feel kind of like the power of God move, but I, but they're healed and it's just, it, there really is no, you know, exact way, right? God does things differently. I want to ask you one thing, Mike, since you mentioned it, the Exodus fifteen twenty six, because we're not under the law, right? Like you said, the dietary law, but there's health benefits yeah. in it, right? You were saying that? Uh, there's health benefits in juicing. Yes. Yeah, and, and you know, I mean, if but I mean, eating and eating maybe not as many crustaceans because people say they're the cockroach of the sea. You know, mm, and you pork, know I mean? stuff like, like that. The closest and, thing to human flesh. But but the thing I want to ask you with that, so you know what I'm saying on that, where it's like we're not under the law, but there's some things of where, like you said, there wasn't refrigeration, but still some of those things, even though we're not under the law, right? All things are lawful, Paul said, but not all things are fruitful or, or you know profitable. And so, but what I want to ask is where it says Jehovah Rapha, but it says like four um, clauses to healing. And I want to hear what you think on this. But he says, if you diligently hear my voice, and this is in the Old Testament, Mm -hmm. before the Spirit really lived in us, right? It kind of came upon people. But he says, if you diligently hear my voice and do what is right in in his sight, so got to also hear his voice, then do what he says, like fast, like for you, and then give ear to his commands and keep all his statutes or precepts, I will then none of these diseases which will. So do you feel, Mike, even though we're not under law, even though the atonement, I mean, you know, I, I believe you believe with me that, you know, uh, Isaiah 53 or 53, 4, by his stripes were healed or five, I think. But by his stripes were healed, that's talking not just of atonement for sin, but also atonement for our healing. But do you believe because that really hit me just recently because my wife, you know, is struggling with cancer. But it's saying hear his voice. Do what's right in his sight, and then obey his commands, all his commands and precepts. How would you do? You, how do you feel about that? Of kind of a precursor to healing. Do you think that has anything to do with people being healed, or do you? Right. There's many keys to healing. For instance, we've already covered faith. Faith is a key to healing, and we've covered uh, the spoken word is a key to healing. And obedience is the key to healing. And in any given circumstance where someone gets healed, one or more of those keys may be the reason. They may not all be present or all be functional in a certain circumstance, but one of them or more are. And so there are, well, another great scripture is Malachi chapter four, where God said unto you that fear my Mm. name, shall the son of righteousness arise with healing in his wings. And so fearing the Lord is a very important thing. And of course, people get hung on that word. It's a word that has two different, absolutely different meanings. Same word, two different meanings. It's not the cringing kind of terror you would feel because you're horrified at somebody stalking you. Uh, It is a, the deepest form of reverence toward God a person can feel. It makes you just melt in not only devotion to him, but awe at his majesty. And when you fear the Lord, he said he would arise over you with healing in his wings. How awesome is that? In Psalm 107, I want to read this to you. This is just so fantastic because it shows how, uh, how is it's not necessary sometimes for us to do what we think we have to do in order to get a healing. Sometimes God just does it out of his mercy. And let me take you to, uh, let me find it, Psalm 107, starting with verse 17. It says, fools, it starts out saying, fools, mm-hmm. because of their transgression mm-hmm. and because of their iniquities, were afflicted. Their soul abhorred all manner of food, and they drew near to the gates of death. Mm -hmm. 
Then they cried out to the Lord in their trouble, and he saved them out of their distresses. He sent his word and healed them and delivered them from their destructions. Amen. And so that's not talking about people who have earned a healing <laughs> because of a sanctified or devoted lifestyle or because they fear the Lord or because they're obedient to him, but they're absolute fools <laughs> that mess their lives up, get sick as a consequence of their sin, but they cry out to God and he heals amen, them. Amen. And I love that too, because a lot of times, like when we pray for people to be healed, like the important thing, I know you, you'll talk about it even more, is that you need to be sensitive to the Holy Spirit too, yeah. because um, word of knowledge and those things are so important. Like it really does, like, I think it, it is important to welcome the Holy Spirit. You can't just like, like to pray for the gift of discernment. Because lo a lot of times a sensationist, like, or ses I always say it so a wrong, cessation. cessationist, they say like, oh, it's not like for today. We don't believe in that. But the sad thing is, is there's so many people, right, in the New Age especially, they they see certain things like in the New Age, right, because they have faith or they can do certain like, um, quote unquote, miracles or different things. And there's demonic healing. And there's demonic healing. And so when they get into Christianity and they're told, no, that's not for today and that, but it's like, God is the same yesterday, today, and forever, and we know that. We know what he wants to because it really does show the people, right, who maybe aren't even saved that, oh, my goodness, like you were saying, God loves me. God really does care for me, and they feel the presence of God. So can you share, too, how important it is to welcome the Holy Spirit, um, especially if, like, when you're praying for someone to be healed and just for discernment and, you know, um, what that looks like? while praying for someone to be healed? Well, discernment is important because Paul recognized that someone had the faith to be healed. Mm. And I wish I could give you chapter and verse on that, but uh, I'll look it up and send it to you. But he recognized that that person was at a point of receptivity. And if you're going to flow in healing, that's a very important thing. Many, many times I've walked through a prayer line and I could sense different people that were ready to receive the baptism of the Holy Spirit or ready to be healed. And God gave me that discernment. And so that's another one of those keys yeah. is having the discernment of knowing where the Spirit of God is ready to move mm -hmm. and who's being quickened by the yeah. Spirit of God to have faith to receive. Mm -hmm. And uh, God, but God's all the time doing Amen. things that stretch me, yeah. that just totally that stretch me. That's good. Uh, I, I was at Christian retreat up in uh, Minnesota years ago, and a lady came to the meeting who had MS in the final stage. Uh -huh. She couldn't even walk. Her two friends were holding her up by either arm, and she also had two crutches that she was using to walk. She could only stay out of bed a half hour every day. Uh -huh. The rest of the time, she was so weak, she had to lay in bed. And I did not know she was not born again. I did not know she had never been to a healing meeting before. I didn't know she was Lutheran. Mm. But anyway, I preached that night. And, of course, my heart went out to her. And that's a lot of what brings healing. Yeah. It's not yeah. formulas. Yeah. It's yeah. loving. Amen. Amen. That's good. If, God, if God heals people because he loves them, we'll be able to participate in the process better if we love That's them. Good, and so I felt compassion for her and went over to her and she had collapsed in the altar praying. Mm -hmm. And I led her in a salvation prayer. And again, I didn't know she had never lifted her hands in worship, but I said, why don't you raise your hands? And she told me later on what happened. She, it felt foreign to her, but it felt wonderful to her. Amen. So she lifted her hands and started thanking God for salvation. And she said, God breathed into her three times. Oh, wow. She heard a breath go <laughs> through her. Wow. And I thought, why three times? And then it dawned on me, spirit, soul, and body. Wow. God was healing her in all three areas. Wow. And immediately she stood up, raised her hands, grabbed the crutches, held them over her head, and walked around the room. Amen. And, and uh, what happened next was incredible. 
uh, normally her husband uh, was used to her having to lay in the bed all day long at home. Well, the next day she woke up and she said she bounded out of bed. She leapt out of bed and she had a six month old baby Uh that she never held in her arms Uh because she was too weak to hold her baby in her arms. So she wanted to do that. And she went in and put her arms under the baby in in the crib. And she told me she almost threw the baby over her head. (laughs) She wasn't that strong. (laughs) And she carried her baby about a half a mile to a construction site where her husband was working. Oh, and he thought that he was seeing a yeah. ghost. Oh. He thought that the baby and the mother had died <laughs> and he was seeing an apparition, yeah. a ghost coming down. Oh. And he was just an old rough around the edges yeah. guy. And he got saved. And her two sons who were punk rockers got <laughs> saved. Because they could not deny what God had done to their mother. And all four of them quit their jobs and went to Bible school. Praise God. So it totally revolutionized that family. Mike, when you're talking about this faith and how you know it saves people and changes people, kids and and dads, um, you know, I'm sure you know Smith Wigglesworth. You've read well, you don't know him, but you've read his stuff. But I love Smith. I don't know. If I'm old, but I'm not that yeah, old. Exactly. <laughs> That's pretty old. I would have liked to have met him, though. But anyways, but Smith said, um, and this is, I think, in the 50s, in the 1950s, he said, I'm sad to see that people in these last days, and this is 50s, are going to depend more on the aspirin bottle yeah. than the anointing bottle. And, you know, it also says when the Son of Man returns, will he find faith yeah. in all the earth? And, you know, we got so many things. We got such extreme you know, prosperity doctrine, we're naming Learjet and all those things. But also we have the other side where the gifts are not for today. Could you speak on, I don't know, I'm sorry if I went past the question, no, no, but sorry. just of, you know, because I really see that. I don't know if you agree, you know, I mean, of course you agree that Jesus said it, but how do we, I mean, if we know the Bible says faith comes by hearing and hearing by the word of God, you know, Romans 10, 17. But how do you speak to that who somebody is maybe an old, like a, from a traditional church that doesn't really believe in the gifts, maybe more of a sensationist, a cessationist, that you would say, how do you, if someone says, you know, I really do want to believe in the whole counsel of God. I really want to believe that Jesus still is the healer and that he's the same yesterday. Today. How would you speak to that? Like, how would you encourage someone who doesn't really have that faith, haven't seen a meeting like yours, yeah. but, you know, I'm at home, I'm listening to this podcast. How would you encourage them to take maybe the baby steps of faith to really believe God, to really believe for healing. But are there some books or or your book or just like scriptures? How would you encourage someone who's maybe more from a more traditional church or or secessionist church that wouldn't believe in the gifts or for today? How would you uh, encourage them to take that baby step to step out in faith to believe that God is the same yesterday and and forevermore? Well, I think it's um, a pitiful thing to believe that the devil can heal and God can. Um, yep. uh, because Satan can only mimic and copy or attempt to copy what God does authentically. Right. And the enemy does deceitfully at times. And so I would encourage people to see that God is far more powerful than, than the enemy. And if you can believe if you can believe that there will be false prophets that will show great signs and wonders in the last days, why can't you believe there'll be true prophets <laughs> who will show great signs and wonders that will actually show the falsehood of the false prophets? Right. I personally believe as we near the coming of the Lord, there's going to be a tremendous confrontation between darkness and light, right. and the battle is going to intensify spiritually and people had better get more than just theology. They're, they better walk in the power of the Holy Spirit. If you have any other thing that you're putting your faith in, sometimes sometimes that can be detrimental. And you've got to be balanced here because some people have situations in their body where if they stop a certain medicine, it can throw things off completely. Mm-hmm. And one time I, I prayed for a man that had diabetes and he went home the next day and took his medicine and got sick. So he cut it in half and he got sick again. And so he cut it in half again and got sick again. So he cut it out altogether and was fine. Mm. 
So he diminished his intake of the medicine, and uh, and and that was a wise way to That's do good, it. Yeah. I, I think you have to mix wisdom with faith. Amen. Sometimes you can have presumption mm-hmm. in the name of faith, yeah. and so uh, there there's a lot of balancing factors yeah. here. Yeah. But what I would like to do is take what we've already learned uh, before the sun goes down. <laughs> I'm standing here at a window, and I forgot to bring the the light in. I've got a television light that I usually bring in when I'm at this particular desk doing an interview. And uh, we were going to be doing the interview earlier, so I wouldn't need that. Anyway, that's my explanation for needing to go ahead and pray before we're plunged into utter darkness here. (laughs) Not outer darkness, utter darkness. (laughs) But... uh, uh, the joy of the Lord is our strength, Amen. and I, I believe joy is a key to healing. Amen. Praise is a key Amen. to healing. Worship is a key to healing. Uh, faith is a key to healing. Humility is a key to healing. Amen. Fear of the Lord Amen. is a key to healing. All of these things work, Amen. and you never know when one particular one will work over the other. So if it's all right with you, Craig, I'd like to go ahead and pray that anyone watching will get a miracle. And I'd like to begin with a confession. Mm -hmm. And let me base the confession on two scriptures, Isaiah 53, 5 and 1 Peter 2, 24. 1 Peter 2, 24 says, with his stripes, you were healed. That's past tense. Really, uh, more correctly, it's the present perfect tense. It's something that happened in the past, but continues to the present. So with his stripes, you were healed. That was from the the future looking back at the cross. But Isaiah was looking forward to the cross. And he said he was wounded for our transgressions. He put it in the past tense. He was bruised for our iniquities. He was speaking of a future event as if it's already happened because it was part of the plan of God. But then in the fifth verse, he said, and with his stripes, we are healed. I personally believe that all of the healings that took place in the Old Testament, in a sense, took place on credit. Mm -hmm. Just like uh, you get a piece of merchandise and you pay it off later. God was letting people get healed in the Old Testament, but the payment was going to be made when Jesus was striped at the pillar. So Isaiah put it in the present tense, with his stripes, we are healed. Peter put it in a past tense perspective, with his stripes, you were healed. And my point is, if we were healed, if it's a past tense fact, it should be a present tense possession. If it's already happened from God's perspective, then it should be a done deal from our perspective. And that should give us an edge of faith that is strong enough to win. That's good. So anyway, uh, if you guys don't mind. I love it. uh, You you know, healing is not only physical, healing is spiritual. Bless the Lord, O my soul, who heals all thy diseases. The soul gets disease, uh, like depression or fear or lust or various things that attack the soul can cause it to be afflicted with soulish diseases. So regardless of whether we're speaking this over ourselves soulishly, spiritually, or physically, let's make a declaration right now. Uh, And then I'm going to pray. Would you just repeat these words after me? Say, in the name of Yeshua, in the name of Jesus, Jesus. I lay claim to my healing. healing. It is my right right. as a child of God God. God. to expect wholeness. 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 My faith makes me whole. My faith makes me whole. And with his stripes, with with his stripes, stripes, I was healed. I was healed. So if I was healed, so if I was healed, then I am healed. Then I am healed. In the mighty name of Jesus. In the mighty name of Jesus. And Father God, on the basis of that declaration, I take authority over Teresa's battle 
with the disease she's been going through and every other person who is listening to this presentation. I take authority over the sickness, over the affliction that has bound their bodies. It's not I, Mike Shreve, who brings healing to them, but I come into agreement with your word, Lord, where you said, I am the Lord who heals you. And you were referred to as the physician, the physician, because you were constantly healing people and constantly telling them that they were forgiven of their sin and therefore they were healed because the same blood that washes away our sin washes away our sickness. Mm -hmm. And I claim that blood flowing yes, through Lord. every single person right Jesus, now. Lord. May every person who's afflicted in some way physically dare to say, I receive my miracle. Amen. I receive my healing. Amen. I claim it right now because if you bought it with your blood, Lord Jesus, you're not going to withhold it from us when we ask for it. it. If it was your delight to provide it, then it's your delight to manifest it. Amen. And you said, if we fear the Lord and if we hate evil, that it will be health to all our flesh. Amen. And I claim those promises right Jesus, now. Man. I claim the promise where you said, if you have faith as a grain of mustard seed, you can speak to this mountain and say, be removed and cast into the Amen. sea and it will obey your voice. Lord, you gave that concept when the disciples said, Master, increase our faith. Lord, increase our faith. And you said to them, if you have faith as a grain of mustard seed, you could speak to the mulberry tree and Amen. say, be uprooted and cast into the sea, and it will obey your voice. Because, Lord, they had faith in your word, but they didn't have faith in their own words yet. And you want us to cultivate faith in our own declarations of faith that are anchored in you. And we anchor our faith in you, in your provision, your provisionary act of being striped at the pillar. You bought our healing. And I claim that for Teresa. I yes. claim that for every person that's listening right now, a full manifestation of your healing power. And Lord, I believe that there's someone listening right now when this is aired that's that's got a different kind of problem. It's bondage to drugs, mm -hmm. a, a bondage that compels them to go back to the same kind of drugs over and over again. And I claim that yoke of addiction being broken and destroyed yes, in their lives. Jesus. And all they have to do right now is say, Jesus, I receive it. Jesus, I accept it. Jesus, I acknowledge you as Lord of my life. And that yoke is broken right now for the glory of God. And I feel it happening. I feel somebody that's going to be delivered from drug addiction when they listen to this mm -hmm. in the name Jesus. of Jesus. Amen. Praise God. Lord, I claim miracles and signs and wonders because they give glory to your name. Amen. You said concerning the blind man in John chapter 9, this man has not sinned, neither his parents, but that the works of God might be manifested in him. Sometimes, Lord, things come upon us just so you can remove them and receive mm -hmm. glory Amen. to your and I receive that right now. I expect that right now. I praise you for it right now. I worship you for healing virtue going forth like a river. Let it be so in Jesus' name. Jesus name. Let it be so in Jesus' name. Amen. In Jesus' name. Praise God. Amen. If you ask anything in my name, Jesus said, I will do it. So we ask in your name, Jesus, let there be light. Let there be healing. Let there be a miracle. Yeah. Let this be the turning point. Just like there was a certain point where the tumor in my body mm -hmm. started shriveling and reducing in size, I command every trace of this cancer to begin disappearing, Jesus. diminishing in size, and disappearing until it is no more. In Jesus' name. Amen. Lord, if you made everything there is out of nothing, if you can make something out of nothing, you can make nothing out of something. Amen. Amen. That's what I'm expecting you to do with Teresa. <laughs> I'm expecting that thing that's attacked her body to be as if it never was. Amen. In Jesus' name. Jesus name. Amen. 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 Praise, Praise God. God.
Thank, Thank you, you, Pastor Mike. Thank, Thank you so much. Praise God. And just your, the their Lord. prayer alone definitely strengthened my faith. And it, it just taught me, too, that it's like so many times I'm like, God, I want you to heal her. I want you to heal my mom. But it just shows me, like, when you're praying, I just felt the presence of God and his love. Like, mm. he loves us, and he knows, like, what's going to happen. And, and we just are so trusting that, like, his will be done, and we know that, um, he loves us and he's for us. He's not against us. And I think that's kind of what you even gave me faith with. It's like, God is for us. He's not against us. We don't have to think, oh, like he wants us to go through this. And he's like, yes, go through this and do it for me. Like he really does want to heal us to get like, to be able to glorify him and say, God, you did that. And so many times we want to give glory to, oh, that person did it or it was this thing or this thing or this doctor. And I believe God uses those things, but to truly when he heals, because he will, that we can give him glory. So uh, we're so thankful for you. And is there anything else you would like to share? Can I share? say one thing before he shares? Yes, of course. I want to say this too, Mike, is that mm. I'm really blessed by you, and that's why I talked so much the last time. <laughs> 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 so, but, but is that it's so neat, and you could pray for us, but, you know, I was saved Baptist. Then I went to a charismatic church, Grace Chapel, which was one of the fastest-growing churches in America at one time here in Tucson and uh, Pastor John Castile, and and then I got filled with the Spirit, and God touched me. I went there to disprove tongues, and God touched me. But now, uh, and then it went, the you know, Toronto blessing went extreme to the barking and weirdness. So then I kind of pulled back, kind of went back to my old Baptist roots. Then it became Calvary, and Calvary here, you know, Calvary was, you know, Chuck Smith was very charismatic. He was with Amy Simple Fierce, right. but then he kind of was hurt by the, here in Tucson, by the the four square and kind of got so he went a little more balanced you know but it's funny how now Calvary's kind of a more Baptist I say than Pentecostal and uh, we need to find that balance you know what I mean so really when I see you it really encourages me to remember that you know I have seen miracles and Amen. I because we want to be balanced right I mean we all want to be balanced and we don't want to go beyond God but we don't want to shrink back from the fullness of Amen. God. And it's like I just see that. And so I wanted to say also with Mariah, thank you. Yeah. Because it really encouraged me that I need to start stepping out more boldly in the name of Jesus to yeah. believe for miracles. To believe for I mean we still we see miracles, we still see healings, but it's just to be a little more um enthusiastic, which yeah. means in Theo filled with God. Yeah. More believing and more faith and more like you said speaking to that mountain speaking to that mulberry tree and believing that there's power in the name of jesus more yeah. because it's easy i don't know if you agree but it's easy in this world to kind of even this christian world to kind of get your faith seemingly diminished but it's thank you for men like you and and you know women of god too that really encourage us to have faith and really believe in the fullness of god so thank you so much yeah well, you are very welcome, and I think it's 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 better to have faith that is not completely realized than to walk in doubt and never make any progress yeah, at all. That's true. Yeah. So, yeah. That's good. Uh, I, even the fight. world says, I quote, uh, I think I saw it at, uh, it was in the locker room of the Phoenix Cardinals, it says, a positive something is better than a negative nothing. <laughs> and so it's sort of, you know, even the world says that so pretty well. Yeah. So. What, well, you want to share some one last thought you might have? Well, I, you did mention my books, yeah. and I do have some books that would be very encouraging to Man. people. I think if there's one that would build their faith, it's a book called 25 Powerful Promises from God. Amen. And in, in that book, I share a lot of ministry stories like I did on the interview today about uh, miracles that have happened as I illustrate the 25 powerful promises, there's 7,487 promises in God's word. So it took me a while to pick out the 25 I thought were the most powerful. And I would encourage people to come to our website, which is shreveministries.org. That's S-H-R-E-V-E, shreveministries.org. And get a copy of 25 powerful promises from God. Also, I have an outreach website that we're, that's being used of God mightily right yeah. now. People around the world are getting saved out of New Age and yoga yeah. and Eastern religions. It's called thetruelight.net, yeah. thetruelight.net. I just put up an article there and an interview, uh, did an interview uh, yesterday uh, concerning the connection between 
Black Lives Matter and Umbanda Spiritism, which is very similar to Santeria. Mm. It's a mixture of African spirituality with uh, Catholicism mm. and uh, Spiritism. Mm. And so we explore various comparative religion subjects on the truelight.net. And people can download a free copy of my uh, testimony booklet called The Highest Adventure mm-hmm. Encountering God right there on the front of the truelight.net. Yes. Well, and we'll put that in the description, right? Yeah, we'll put all of that in the description below. So make sure you guys check that out. And anything else, Pastor Mike? Um, no, except I love you yeah. guys and look forward to We love you too. We have to have you come out to do some of these days. Yes. Yeah. Well, thank you so much for joining us. Hey guys, thanks so much for joining us on Calvary Conversations. If you haven't already, please make sure to like, subscribe, and share this video. If you would like to listen to us wherever you get your podcast, just type in Calvary Conversations. Also, make sure to follow us on Instagram at Calvary Conversations. Make sure to check out our new merch in the description below and praying that you have a blessed week. Mm-hmm.